So this podium is, is interesting, and uh, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this. Mr. Day is the campus coordinator of this particular building. And the first time I spoke, there was uh, 25 cents under here. And today, there's 26 cents. So there's a penny improved, so he must be telling me something that he must have liked what I said the last time. So, Mr. Day, thank you for the 26 cent under the podium. All right. So what's next? And we have a lot of conversations as it relates to transportation, food service, maintenance, but our real core business is education. That's what we do. And these other things are subsets of our world, but we have to do them because they involve children and they involve adults. So here are the topics for the night. Academic focus, facilities master plan enrollment, highlights of departments, district budget, community involvement, honors diploma scholars, teacher of the year, Fulbright scholars. Not a long agenda, you, you agree? Work with me, folks, do you agree? Then, okay, if you agree, then here's the rest of the agenda, all right? Alumni spotlight, dam distinction, summer meals, transportation update, November 8 levy, COVID-19 protocols, community learning centers, where are our graduates, and important dates. Now, please understand, this presentation, because of all of the attributes that we have in the district, could go on for hours, but we're going to limit this to approximately 55 minutes. Uh, anybody ever come to the first state of the schools that I ever did? All right. So the next day after the state of the schools, I saw most of the staff just kind of walking with a limp. And the reason for it is that state of the schools lasted three hours and 30 minutes. So we're not going to do that tonight. That's our core business, how we educate young people. And we do it with fidelity, and it's not for certain kids, it's for every single child in the district. <clears throat> we had a summer program, and I'm going to give you some stats of the summer program. So, how many of you are really good math people? All right. And someone has confirmed that you're a really good math person. This is not just your identity about it. What course is failed in high school across the country than any other course? Algebra 1. So if we know that for a fact, we have to make sure that we have a safety net for young people so that they don't struggle. Because, remember, high school is four years. If you fail Algebra 1, ninth grade, which is when it happens, you are definitely going to take two maths at the same time. That doesn't help. So you're probably to be taking Algebra one and Geometry at the same time, correct, Dr. Raglan? Okay. The problem with it, I'm not motivated for the first math, now you're going to give me two. Math teachers in the room, raise your hand. Okay. These are the people who like math. However, we have young people that struggle. But here's the whole objective. If I can get you to start liking a subject that you struggle with, you get better. So I'd like for uh, Mr. Doctor to stand for a minute. Mr. Doctor, of course, is our food service director. He is our chef. But he is also our part-time, full-time golf coach. He is an assistant golf coach. You've been working with young people on their swing and their delivery. In the beginning, they struggle, right? As they get better, do they want more golf or less? More. Thank you, Mr. Doctor. We've been working on that for two days, so he got it. All right. So the whole objective is when kids get better, they want more of it. So let's look at what happened over the summer. 9 through 12, there were 48 students in credit recovery for Algebra 1. 48 students, 100% of them got the credit and their grades improved. 100%. That took a lot of dedication and a lot of time for every person on that team. So other high school math, be it geometry, algebra 2, 
uh, there were 21 students, and 90% of them earned that credit. And we can go down the list through the science, the social studies, electives, ELL, enrichment. But the question today is, did summer school prove to be beneficial? You can say yes. Okay. Without summer school, what's going to happen to that young person? So when we start talking about changing the budget and changing the outcome of what happens with the budget, you know what? If you have to cut something, eventually, that might be something we have to eliminate to keep the core academics going. This is a necessity. Now, I know it probably never happened to anybody in this room, but has anyone in this room, if you know someone, remember, I know it's not you, ever had to take a course more than once? Okay, you got better. And so this attribute has to stay and be part of who we are and what we do, because without the resources, the summer program can't work with efficiency. Facilities master plan, incredible job. If you notice something about the facilities master plan, as the new buildings come up, other new things are going to start popping up around. Anybody have a neighbor? When you do something to your house, they do something to theirs? That means they're following the leader. So the two new buildings actually is attracting a whole different level of opportunities for other people, other businesses to come into our community. And it actually is increasing the value of the homeowners. The homeowner's value increases because these buildings are here. Now eventually what we want to do with the campus as it relates to the stadium, we'd like for the stadium to not just be the football, soccer, lacrosse venue, we'd like to start earning revenue from the Ohio High School Athletic Association because our facilities look so great that they let us have tournaments there and then they pay us. So other districts are getting that opportunity right now. We'd like to be on that cutting edge as well because our facilities are turning out to look pretty awesome. People ask the question and we know the answer, but I think it's important for you to know the answer. There was a gentleman that says, I understand your district superintendent, but you do understand that there's very little diversity there because you're 99% African American. Not true. We're 54% African American. How many of you knew that? 54%. The other growing population is our Hispanic population that we just, we, we encourage Hispanic families to come to this district, 25%. And then you look on down the line, you have multiracial, 9%, white, 8%, and you can read it for yourself that, hey, listen, we're growing in other ways in other areas. The other part is you need to know how many students are really in your district, 4,082. 4,082 students are in your district. And during the course of the day, we transport about 2,600 of those kids. So there's a margin of error, and we calculated it, Mr. Denny, the margin of error is 1% because we have a margin of error of 17 students or 17 families that will call during the course of the day saying, my bus didn't come, my bus was late. But the whole objective for me is I don't want any margin of error. I want every kid picked up at the right time, at the right stop, and delivered home safely every single day. So we have departments here, and all of our departments have a focus. And I'm going to give you a few of the highlights of the departments and some things that they've accomplished that you probably wouldn't see in print, not unless you had a conversation with them. They're very modest people. They don't go out and brag about what they do. They're very humble in their work, and they keep doing whatever it takes to make our district better. So you'll hear a little bit about the business, community engagement, human resources, legal services, student services, teaching and learning, and finally technology. Some of the attributes of things that they do that you don't know that they do. And I thought it would be very fitting for you to know exactly how my colleagues do the work. Business affairs. So you have this great stadium, and if you've been to the games lately, you see this incredible wrap 
really representing our district in a very holistic way. New graphics. Uh, there are other sp there's people who have sponsored on the scoreboard, and that sponsorship is not for free. We charge for that sponsorship. Because even doing a commercial, a commercial can cost you a million dollars. But they're able to sit in front or have their graphics or have their information in front of two or 3,000 people at the same time for a margin of the cost. So we actually make revenue off of selling that uh, advertising space on that scoreboard. And people are eager to pay it because they know what the return looks like. And the final one is, I've already mentioned the high school, uh, Ohio High School Athletic Association. They go around and look at different venues. Who could host a tournament, and we pay you for hosting a tournament? Now, we may not be in the tournament, and that's okay. But if we could still make revenue because our facility is done right, that's what the community should want to see. That means we're coming to you less for revenue because we're making our own, and we want to be self-generated. The Department of Community Engagement. How many of you saw inside your schools? You saw that publication. And if you haven't, we'll get you a copy. This was one of the things that the Department of Community Engagement came up with and says, we want to produce something that's never been produced. And it came out in June, and it's inside your schools, telling you about your schools so that people don't speculate. Tonight's presentation is not about feelings at all. It's only about facts. Everything on this screen is a fact, not a feeling of the superintendent, not a feeling of the board, or any administrators or teachers. One of the things that need to happen in our community to make it stronger, to make it better, we need to hire our own people. So these are four young people who've actually gone through project-based learning early on, They've graduated from college, and now they work for us. Usually when Mr. Martin is presenting, he'll say something pretty clever. And I'm saying, look at the four people, and he'll usually say, you can clap for that. All right. That's big. Because eventually it becomes 10 and 15 and 20, and that means the young people who have gone through project-based learning understand it, loved it enough to come back and share those attributes with young people. Imagine having a teacher who was part of that curriculum and part of that development coming back to you and saying, I understand PBL to a way, in a way that you don't. That's huge. One of the things that we want to do, we know young people from time to time, they get in trouble. But we don't want them to have a direct pipeline to the courts. So we've created a diversionary program that says, if you get in trouble and it's court related, there are times where we can work with the different police departments. And when we work with the different police departments, they're saying, Superintendent, we're going to give you that leverage to work with them in a diversionary court so their names are not associated with what happens downtown in the city of Cincinnati. Anybody here ever made a mistake? Anybody here made more than one? Okay. Diversionary court is a way of helping young people deal with the issues they have without going in front of a magistrate, without going in front of a judge, without going in front of a lockup system. Now, I can tell you that Student Services Department, the way that they've worked this has been genius. It's been a genius situation from the beginning because young people have come back and says, I am not going to do the same thing that I did before. Now I am going to be an asset to your community. All over America, is crime up? Yes, it is. We figured out a way to deal with it. Department of Technology, incredible department. The Department of Technology was a lifesaver during COVID. It saved our lives. It kept your kids engaged and kept the work moving. And one of the things that I can tell you, we now have a spectrum partnership, but folks, we have 900 seats available for this opportunity, but guess what? We're only tapping into 200. This program is looking for 700 families in your community where they would get free spectrum, free internet access 
for no fee. It's a $60, $70 experience that doesn't cost you any money. How many of you knew that? That word needs to get out. We're looking for 700 families to get free internet access. And we realized something, that when we issued the Chromebooks to the young people, we, 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 we thought it was a victory. And I have to tell you, we try to celebrate when it's time. But we gave them the Chromebooks, but there's nothing connected to it. So we figured out that there has to be another connection. The Chromebook by itself without internet access is not no good. It doesn't work for our young people. So Spectrum is partnered with us that says, I have 900 of these devices that we can put into your home for free. We connect them for you, and there is no bill. 200 families are taking advantage of it. So what I've asked Ms. Jackson and Ms. Hobbs to do is have a forum with some of the parents and have a forum to say, this is how Spectrum has changed my life, and I'm telling it to you in real time so you don't think it's a hoax, it's a gimmick they get the service for free. And it doesn't matter who you are. People were asking the question, Superintendent, are we still project-based learning? Are we still part of new tech? Well, the teaching and learning department says, yes, we are. And so there was a big workshop where there were professionals that went to a PD week just to reestablish themselves as project-based learning uh, experts. So we have not forgotten our journey. Remember, taxpayers supported this idea because these buildings are designed for PBL. So we wanted to make sure we did it with fidelity, and the PBL mission is still going strong. One of the things that we realized, we're grading our students in a way that's really unfair at times. It's really unfair. And so we reinstituted the grading process, and we're going to vet that with the board in teaching and learning that we're going to change the grading process that when a student takes a course over, you get credit, full credit for that course. And we're adopting this policy based on some research that was done by the principal of the high school and teaching and learning. We're using the policy that's used at Indiana University and UC. Now, we use universities that were close by because more than likely our kids may go there. So it's a university endorsement. It's not something that's a watered down opportunity. It's used to help this kid strengthen his academics while retaking a course that may, I may have struggled in or I may not have been that serious about. So it's authentic assessments that help young people grow and it gets her closer to the bridge of graduation. So I asked Mr. Seymour, craft something for me, show me and show the public how much money is used on instruction. $39 million of our budget is used on instruction. $15 million is used on operations, and you would be happy to know that only $1.1808 million is used on athletics. So we're, we're dicing the dollar the right way. As I mentioned when we first started, our core business is academics. We have supplemental services in our district just because those things help young people grow. Athletics is a supplemental. The main thing is the educational side of who we are and what we do. So we're using the dollar in a very, very strategic way. And at the end of this presentation, there will be a link where we're going to send it to you so you can show it to your friends and families of how we really use the resources of this community. The other part, we have students with disabilities in our district. And one of the things that we figured out, especially for this one, specific learning disabilities, 37%, that means that the young people will have an opportunity to grow out of that experience, meaning I don't need the IEP and the 504 anymore. Because working with families, working with teachers, working with the experts, we have worked ourselves out of it where I don't have that disability anymore. See, people have a myth about disabilities. They believe that once you have it, you always have it. Not true. That's a myth. 
And other districts have figured out that, guess what? It has to be a myth because I should be able to work through whatever troubles I have. Listen, folks, we have you for 13 years. We should be able to help you with anything. The one that I am very concerned about is here. We have to be very careful because COVID came, masks were worn, and the articulation of young people in class has changed dramatically across the country. Young people are not articulating as well as they did before. Babies are not speaking as early as they used to. So we have to watch this number, but I have to tell you, the students with, uh, the, students, the Department of Students with Disabilities, one of the things that they can tell you is they, they have been watching this thing very, very carefully, and our school psychs are saying, we need to put some other emphasis because this number can grow, not just at Winton Woods, but all over the country. Imagine trying to teach a child how to speak and they have a mask on. How well do you articulate? Anybody here had your mask on during COVID and the heightened parts of COVID and someone asked you to repeat yourself? It's a barrier. But here's the thing. We don't make excuses, we make improvements. So the barriers that, are, that exist, it doesn't matter. We will overcome the barriers. This is a message that went out to our families. Very powerful message. It says, we're extremely proud of your child for making academic progress this year. According to our data collection, as well as valuable teacher input, your child will transition from student services. This includes accommodations while on IEPs and 504s. This growth could not have happened without the joint project of dedicated students, parents, and staff. This transition could be a little awkward in the beginning, but we will continue to monitor your child's progress with fidelity throughout the upcoming school year. Ms. Bray, please stand. Please do not hesitate to contact Tanya Bray, Director of Student Services, in the event that you have concerns. We're saying that your child has grown through this process. They no longer need the IEP in 504, but in the event that they struggle academically, we will be there to assist them. If you are a parent, if you were a parent or you had a friend who had a child that had a disability and you received that letter and they received that letter, would they be proud of the accomplishment of their child? Absolutely. We're a community, and we have to act like a community. So we had the chance to be in the BFR parade. All of our musicians, our athletes, our executive team, we had the whole town at a BFR parade. And the band was so incredible with their shirts on, we are family, that the Winton Woods Band, along with all the other people that were working there, we received the grand prize as the best band in the land. All right? No other band can compete. Now, I think when some bands were standing on the sideline listening and they heard us play, they got back on their bus. In our community, parents are everything. They are everything. They are the people that make the engine go. So we've been working on a study, teachers and family join forces. Bridges are better built when home and school work together. We have to be a partnership. It can't be them versus us. It has to be a partnership that's endorsed by the integrity that says we can do it together. We're committed to doing the work and we would like to partner with all families in the community to make it work seamlessly. One of the things that the state requires is you are going to put your children in a situation, young people, and give them rigors and assessments, and if it turns out right, you'll have honors diploma students. This is a record breaker. We'll have over 70 students earning honors diploma. But I can tell you, there are many districts that have children just as intelligent as ours are. However, they will never get the honors diploma. Anybody know why? They don't offer enough rigorous courses to meet the standards. 
So one of the things we can't do is we can't cut back on our standards and we can't cut back on our teachers because they're offering rigorous standards to help our kids reach honor diploma status. These honor diploma scholars are giving them the entitlement to earn scholarships they wouldn't ever, ever have. So when we start talking about the budget and people say, cut this, cut this, cut this, there are certain things we cannot tamper with. This is the future of our district. And so at the end of the day, when we're giving kids, offering kids rigorous courses, we're putting them in a position to be honors diploma students that are recognized by the state of Ohio, not just a Wynton Woods endorse endorsement. And without the right courses, you don't meet this. There are some districts and some school systems, they don't have any kids that have honors diplomas, none. Nobody meets that standard. And it's all about the course offering, but this can't be done without this group. State Board of Education Teacher of the Year. Those are the people that make it work. Now, think about it. State Board of Education Teacher of the Year. Do you think other districts want her? Yes. But what we do is we lock her in her room every night so she can't go anywhere. Now you get a chance to meet the twins. This, that's what I call these guys. When you look at them, they, they look like twins. There you go. All right. Fulbright Teacher of Global Classrooms Award recipient. You've got one in 2019, 2020, and then another one came. That's unheard of. So when people say, Superintendent, you have a failing district, I'm saying you must not be reading our print because we're not. We're a district that's growing with fidelity and we're encouraging young people and families to send your child to Wentwood City Schools because we will educate them. Some of our alum, you have Robin Walker that was introduced to us by Dave Bell, honored by New York Metropolitan Art Museum, class of 1993. Eric Barron, class of 2014. This, this guy that graduated in 2014 is interesting. When he was two years old, he says, I want to be a, a helicopter pilot. And he is living his dream. The last one you will see is Cornell Beecham. He was a Division III uh, wrestling champion in, uh, at his university at Mount St. Joe. He won the state. Division three. How many of you knew that? How many of you knew that I was a division one wrestling champ for the state? No one. All right. One of the things about receiving awards that makes it really relevant, if you receive that award one year and you receive it the second year and the third year and the fourth year, that's where the real magic comes. Everybody can do it one time. So let's give an applause for the music department, seven years. For outstanding support of music education, enriching the lives of children, and advancing student achievement. Can I tell you right there what this award tells me? It tells me that young people are going to higher ed and graduating and majoring in music and coming back and becoming producers, conductors, writers. And they learned the skill right here at Wynton Woods City Schools. Raise your hand if you were ever in the music department. Raise your hand if you were an outstanding musician, according to you. This right here is one of the most powerful pieces of things we've ever done. Found an old bus, wrapped it, and made it through Nutrition is the Mission bus. But I can tell you, one of the things that you have to understand about us, there's something called follow the leader. Everybody has a Nutrition is the Mission bus. Every school district has one now. So what do we have to do? Now we have to get two. Or we have to get a Nutrition is the Mission boat. Or a Nutrition is the Mission plane. So anytime people try to catch up with us, we do something a little more dynamic. One of the things that we found out Every school district since the beginning of time has had a free a lunch program in the summer. 
The lunch program was usually housed at the school. If the kids don't live next to the school, how do they get the food? So the bus takes the food to them. We got better. All right. I'm going to ask you this question, and you will know the answer immediately. I practiced this on a few people when they knew the answer. If I dial this number, 347-1111, who am I talking to? You know it. So we're going to be the trademark. One of the things that LaRosa has figured out is, guess what? Right here, let me go back. Right here. These are the ladies working in the transportation department trying to fill these calls. You can't route the calls and take the calls at the same time and talk to the parents because you're going to put them on hold. And one of the things the parents have told us as superintendent, I understand there is a driver shortage in our region. Anybody haven't heard of that? Driver shortage in our region. And one of the things that parents want to know more than anything else, I know there's a driver shortage, and I know you told me a day in advance there's going to be a driver shortage. However, I want to make sure I can talk to someone about my child. Anybody here ever made a phone call and no one picks up? So here's, again, here's what happens in our system. We try to make the phone call. These two incredible ladies are trying to handle the volume of calls. And what happens is sometimes you don't get a chance to have a pickup. And the phone continues to ring, and that frustrates the parents more. The next employee that they see is the bus coming that was late. And then there's a conflict. We're going to eliminate that. So we're creating a call center. So what would happen is there's a parent who calls, but you're not calling them because they're routing information to the call center. The call center would actually pick up the call and tell you exactly where your child is and what time they would be home in real time. There's no, there will be no more dead calls where it says no one picked up because that's what frustrates the parents more than anything else. No one picked up the phone. So think about it. They call the call center. Parents talk to the call center. These people route information, and then what you have right here is a happy customer. That's what we want. We want a happy, satisfied customer. Because, like I said before, everyone in this room knows that there's a driver shortage, especially in this region. Now, we're not saying that the drivers will get them there any quicker, but you know exactly where they are. And someone has picked up to actually have a real conversation with you. Now, as it goes through, we get better, we get better, we get better, but we're starting here, and we're hoping that this is going to be operational by next week. And there are some real interesting people that are working on it, the people in transportation, the business office, the human resources, and technology. And eventually what's going to happen is Drew Jackson is going to send out a publication to the parents letting them know the call center does exist, and, you can, and those calls will be routed, and you will be talking to a real person. And we're going to have it in various languages too. We talk about being diverse, but now we have to show that we're diverse. You knew this was coming. There's a $3 million operating expenses levy on the ballot. Folks, without this levy, there will be other situations. So in this building alone, and I did tell the administrators that I would mention it, there used to be an early arrival uh, for students based on their grade level. So if the student was scheduled to be here at 9 o'clock and his sibling was dropped off at 8.30, we let both of them come. That cost money. So we had to cut back on that. We had to. And we had to cut back on if your student is leaving late and both students can stay at the same, because it took bodies that had to be compensated for doing this work. And I can tell you, there will be other consequences in the event that the levy does not pass. We don't talk about threats of a system. We just talk about the reality of it. Remember, we haven't had new funding additional funding, excuse me, since 2009. You can't run your budgets and household from budget from 2009. I know you can't, and you know you can't. 
So yeah, it's failed several times. But we have to may have the momentum from the parents and the community to pass it because that's what makes us stand out. We're talking about $15 on a $100,000 property. That's it. And for the parents who are taking advantage of the Spectrum opportunity, it's a deal. You're getting a $60 Spectrum thing for zero, and we're asking you for the $15 a month. That's it. $15 a month so we can keep the higher standards that we're talking about. $15 a month so we can keep athletics moving. $15 a month so we can encourage people about transportation. $15 a month so we can make sure we have honors diploma students. That's what you're paying for. Other systems pay the price to get better. We have to learn to pay the price to get better. That is not optional. And guess what? Everybody in this room, regardless if you were a private student, a parochial student, a public school student, somebody's taxes pay for your education, regardless if you want to accept it or not. That is the truth. However, here's the strange part. We talk about the group of people that vote against the levy every year. That's their mission. That's their job. That's what they, cho that's what they choose to do. You're letting a small amount, a small group of people make decisions for all of your children. That's not right. It's not right by your standard. I met this nice lady and she says, Superintendent, I did not vote against the levy. And I said, I appreciate you. But she says, I did not vote, which means in turn, you voted against the levy. So we have to get out there and show people that we're supporting the education of this system that your children are rooted in. And I will show you when you put your money and your time and energy into the work, I will show you in the next few slides what it looks like. We know COVID has been around. We know COVID is not leaving right now, but we have prepared ourselves in a very different way. So we talk about getting tested, isolating yourself, wearing the mask, because one of the things we have to realize, when you wear the mask, you're protecting other people. That's a responsibility for the system. Regardless of the vaccine status inside, isolate for five full days and resume regular activities on day six if you are fever-free for 24 hours. We have two COVID people that are handling the business in addition to their other work. Anything that happens with a young person, it's rallied through the nurse, and, and Tanya Bray takes care of that information about children and COVID, and then Courtney Wilson takes care of it from an adult perspective. So we have the right people taking care of the system to make sure we do it with fidelity. When you are on your way out, just before I, I, I end, I am going to have Mr. Denny step out and be the greeter at our um, community learning center. We have conversations, real conversations now. We're ready to launch this. So Dr. Jolene De uh, Joseph at the Health Center Connection and Dr. Stephen Wilson at Mercy Health, they're going to help us create this, this center. We went to visit a couple of them. And I won't name the schools where you have the centers, but ours can be better. I'm always trying to be better because that means we're taking care of our children in the right way. Now, there are people in the community that says, Superintendent, I don't have any children in the district. Why would I vote for your levy? Why would I support it? Because the health center will actually be a place that you can use yourself. There are not 50 doctor offices in these two communities. There are very few. We could be your advocate. We could be your supporter. We could be your conduit to make sure that your health is taken care of. Because right now, we know COVID's not leaving. How do we accommodate you and fight it at the same time? Now, you might want to see something up there about monkeypox. I'm trying to act like I don't know about it. Not right now. Because there'll be something else coming around the corner. So every Friday, I meet with a group of superintendents, and we have conversations with the health commissioner and also the epidemiologist as it relates to COVID. And they give us facts of what facts to give to you. I send that report to the board every Friday so they know exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to deal with it. So I told you, working in a system 
that has fidelity, working in the system that puts his dollars in the right place to educate our kids, guess what? This is how it looks. This is how it turns out. We have a student, several students at the Art Academy. Augusta Tech College. Bluffton. Bowling Green. Central State. Christ College of Nursing. Cincinnati School of Phlebotomy. These are graduates from this year. Cincinnati State, Clark Atlanta, Golden Colle Galen College of Nursing, Georgetown College, Georgia Southern, Grambling State, Hampton, Hawking College, Jackson State, <laughs> Kaiser University, flagship campus, Kent State, Kentucky State, I said Kentucky State, all right. Lakeland University, these are kids that are in college right now, the graduates that just graduated. This is where they are. They don't get there without these incredible teachers and incredible staff members and administrators making this happen. There are more, Marion University, Miami University Hamilton, Miami University Oxford, Miles College, Moeller Beauty Hollywood Academy. Now, people say, why is Moeller there? Look at all the beautiful hairstyles. We need Moeller to be there. When, you know when COVID came and you couldn't go to the hairdresser? There were more hats sold to women than any other time. Mount St. Joseph, Mount Union, NASCAR Technical Institute. We have never had a kid there. North Carolina A&T, Northern Kentucky, Norfolk State, Ohio Dominican, Ohio State, Purdue Global University, Robert Morris University, Seminole State College in Florida, Southern University and A&M College, Tennessee State, Texas Southern, Tiffin, University of Cincinnati. And what I want you to understand is you'll see about 50 colleges, and it does not mean 50 students. Some of these colleges have like 10 and 15 students going to them. Not done. UC Blue Ash, University of Oregon, University of Pikeville, University of Tampa, University of Toledo, Wayne State University, West Virginia University, Wilberforce University, Wilmington College, Winston-Salem State University, Wright State, Xavier, Youngstown State, United States Air Force, United States Army, United States Navy. Folks, we need to applaud the accomplishments of our kids. They are there right now because teachers, staff members, food service, custodians, bus drivers cared enough to make sure they had a quality education. So regardless of what you hear out there when people say a failing district, don't listen. Because a failing district can't produce that. A failing district cannot produce that list that you just saw. It's impossible. So here are some things that are going to happen, some important dates. So there's a homecoming game against Anderson on September 23rd. And there is the next thing. Every kid who's doing exceptional wealth wants that October 24th. They can't wait. Now, there are some other kids that say, man, October 24th came sooner than I thought. Let me go back. Community tailgate. What we did is we have a, a regular tradition. And when we talk about I don't care if the, if the football team goes 0-10 or 10-0. We're still going to celebrate with them in the end. It says, we appreciate you keeping your grades up and being on the field. So we have a free tailgate. It'll be against Lebanon Senior Night. It's a, a community tailgate forum. We've been doing it for about five years, and it is great. So the high school kicks it off in the beginning. And they have their opening day, their opening kickoff, and they celebrate the first game of the season. Well, guess what? Administratively, we take care of the last one. 
along, of course, with yours truly, Mark Doctor, prof providing all the goodies. March 9th, South Campus Night of Freedom, and March 16th. I want to say a little bit about the Night of Freedom. This is not about black and white. This is about having, giving young people the resources to know that I can be anything I want to be because my mind is free and my spirit is right. So when we put young people into a position that says, I am comfortable in my classrooms, I am comfortable with my teacher, I am inspired by other adults that are around me, I can be everything and anything I want to be. It is the freedom to choose, the freedom to choose to be successful. And so that's what the Night of Freedom has converted itself into. Because I don't want people out there in the community talking about critical race theory, that's not what it's about. It's about the freedom to be educated with fidelity so that I can make my community better. What we want to do is very, very simple. We want young people to go away to these universities, go away to these jobs of choice, go away to the armed forces, and then come back and live in the community and strengthen it. That's what we want. Because that's how other communities are beating us. They're not beating us because the kids are smarter. They're beating us because we have to make sure that there's ample housing for our kids to come back to and be viable citizens in our community every single day. Raise your hand if you left your community, you went to college, you went to the armed forces, you went to the world of work, and you came back. Raise your hand. That's the power. Because you made the system powerful. Because you came back and gave it another boost. Think about the communities that you really see that you're like, man, this community is striving. If you look at some of the real interior scenes of the community, you'll find out that the young people came back. Anybody ever been in a church that the church is starting to kind of slowly die off? It's missing young people. It's missing young people. And when you put the real test out there, young people are the people that are going to take care of us for the next 50 years. The buildings that were designed, is designed for them. So when people say, I'm not going to vote for the levy, guess what? At the end of the day, you're telling a young person, I am not voting for your future. I don't care enough to vote for your future. And we know the future of America is what makes America what it is. Questions? Yes, ma'am. to everybody in this room and to every person who's going to watch this on Ray Cross, I have a group of people who are very solid, very committed, intellectual people that can deliver the message as well as I do. And one of the things you will understand, because I am one person, but any person who can gather a group of people and say, Superintendent, can you meet me here to tell this story? I will show up anywhere, any place, any time because that's our responsibility. And you're right. What kind of program, what kind of levy did we run before? There were some technical difficulties as it relates to running the levy. We still did it, but there were some things that were really out of sorts that we had to just manage it the way that we could. But Ms. Franklin, your question is absolutely on point. Where were you? Not you, but us. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I totally agree. Yes, ma'am. So, I'm going to speak. I just want to put back on that. So, uh, my name is Angela Knight. Um, I've been working with Dr. Brandon Weird. Um, we're going to kind of represent the um, Wentworth Achievement Booster. Yes. Uh, and we've been reaching out to board members. We've been reaching out to a lot of the community representation. Um, we went to the city council. We went to the 
Parks and War Trek um, meeting. Um, we got a work from the historical society for the levy uh, so that we can start campaigning. And we're just two people. Uh, I'm literally just a parent. That's the way that I got involved. And I was asked to be a part of the parent engagement committee um, with the school, but I've heard nothing else. Okay. And, and like she said, it's the middle of September. We're talking about a levy that's going to be in six weeks. Uh, and we're running out of time. So we want the community to come out and support it. We have to get out there and get the message out. Because I believe in this district. I believe our kids deserve it. I believe our schools deserve it. Um, but we have to not be silent either. You know, there are football games that happen every Friday. We can be passing out literature out. You know, there are yard signs that say no, that my neighbors pay for with their own money. Yes. I have people that are willing to donate to get our yard sign to say yes. Okay. So I think there's people out there, um, but we need to collectively come together to be able to do that. Um, and we have a very short window of time to do so. Okay. And again, as I mentioned before, we're working with a team of people to make our presence much better, Ms. Franklin, than we did before. Because I think when people really hear the message, like I mentioned today, this, this, this thing today is not about how the superintendent feels. This is about the facts of this community. And anything that I put up here you can challenge, you can look, you can read about, because it's a fact, it's not a feeling. And I do agree, the more people hear, the more we can encourage people to do it. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's our community. Yes. If we can't get our parents to Absolutely. gather around, the community is, you know, of course, hard, but 18,000 people. So whatever we need to be doing, we've got to do it, and we've got to do it now. Okay. Uh, you're wasting money putting a levy up to the you know, okay. energy behind. Totally agree. So I was out there when we were trying to build these buildings, handing out flyers at the football game. We've got to be doing that and doing it. And we have several games coming up, and we will push that same opportunity. Uh, what we have to make sure we do with Fidelity is to use the funds to purchase the signs to do the things that we need to do. And we're working on that. We're working right now. If people want to give to the levy, because all of the administrators are going to, all the teachers union has already done it. OPC has already done it. We have to follow suit because one of the things you can't do is you can't run a successful levy without funds. And so we need to generate the funds in order to make it work. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? My name is Monica Holt. So I do a lot of um, volunteer work politically so I'm all over the levy. I will tell you all, my child, we transferred into this school district. I grew up out here. We transferred in from Northwest. Um, so far, this has been a phenomenal difference from where we were. We are all about education. We are pursuing higher education, all those fun things. As far as, as, far as the levy, um, I have done volunteer work on various levies and politics for about 20 years. Happy to help with whatever y'all need, I'm in. And okay. Some. All right. So um, members of my executive team stand so they can see you because you can talk to any of these people about opportunities, about how you can support the levy. They will tell you how to do it. All right. I wanted you to put a familiar face with the name. And then we have our treasurer who cannot actually collect money for the levy. It is against the law to do it. You can't use our own money to support the levy. So he is not the treasurer, but he can give you the name of the treasurer and how to make your donation. Mr. Seymour, stand, please. All right. Okay. You guys have been an incredible audience. I appreciate you immensely. And for the people who spoke about let's run the levy with fidelity, Ms. Franklin hit the nail on the head. The people who are out there voting, that's a small amount that's saying no. There are 18,000 people in this community alone. And she said, 
If you talk about the 4,000 people, the 4,000 children that we have in the district, guess what? If we have 5,000 voters, nobody can outvote us. It can't happen. Mathematically, it cannot happen. 5,000 votes changes it. 10,000 just takes us way over the top. So there's something in this whole operation for everyone. I want to be proud that I'm the superintendent of this district, and I know you want to be proud that you're parents of this community. So I don't know what people think about us from time to time, but when a levy fails or a bus doesn't run right or a kid gets hurt or something, man, we are grieving it. We struggle with it, and we challenge ourselves every day to get better. So I appreciate your time, your energy, your patience, and go Warriors.